in Facebook Live, and this is our second or third week of doing a live broadcast of the message. So that is up and running, and that is on our Spring Hills Utica worship page. And, uh, and also, uh, the message will be on our YouTube page. So uh, you can get plugged into those things as well to watch it in the future if you so desire. Okay, this is week two of a sermon series that we're calling Free to Live. If you missed last week's message, you can go to Facebook, YouTube, and, and look those up. You can pick up a book study and a study guide at the back. Uh, the, the book study is a book by John Eldridge called Free to Live. And there's a study guide that I uh, have unofficially published with permission from the publisher uh, to do that. So uh, those are there available in the back. Uh, people are using those in various ways. I had somebody that watched the uh, uh, YouTube broadcast or the Facebook broadcast last week and said, hey, can I get that? I'd like to do it with my family at home. They don't attend here. And I said, sure, I'll get that to you. So they're doing that. We have a group of men that are meeting on Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock. And they're using that study guide and going through that, looking at the scriptures and, and seeing what God has to say uh, to us. And there is a brand new home group meeting uh, at the home of Andy and Vicki Rao, seated right back over here. If you just raise your hand, Andy, wow. Vicki there. So if you're interested in that home group, this Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, they can give you the address on where they live and directions on how to get there. And uh, so those things are happening. All right. So finish this for me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, to see what he could see. There's various versions of that. Of course, you know the rest of that. So yeah, uh, he climbed up into a sycamore tree because he wanted to see. He wanted to take a closer look. He'd heard about Jesus, obviously, and he was curious. We don't really know how much he heard uh, I think there's some things that we can uh, assume. And today we're going to take a closer look at this wonderful, beautiful story because it's really a story of salvation. You know, the Bible really only has one message to it. Uh, it's not a, it's, there, there's various chapters and versions uh, within the story. And uh, it's really only one story. And it's the story of God and his rescue of the human race. And Zacchaeus is a beautiful picture of that. Now, we may not be able to relate to Zacchaeus on a personal level in terms of lifestyle and, and his job, his profession, and, and those kinds of things. But I, I know we can relate to Zacchaeus on the deeper levels of our heart. So we're going to take a closer look at this. If you're following along in Scripture, it's in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm not going to read that in its entirety uh, to start off with. Uh, but we'll, we'll be looking at uh, the various verses of it. So here's how we're going to here's how we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to look at uh, the city, Jericho. We're going to look at the sinner, Zacchaeus. We're going to look at the savior, Jesus. We're going to take a look at the citizens of Jericho and their reaction to what happened with. Uh, uh, Zacchaeus, and then a summary. And I'm going to give you the summary right now. Okay, so in case you tune me out, go to sleep, you know, uh, start daydreaming about lunch or whatever it is you're thinking about, here's the summary. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's it. The summary. That's really the whole story. And then it works itself out in an individual that has been known as Zacchaeus. So let's think about the city, first of all, because Jesus is passing through uh, uh, Jericho. Jericho was a commerce city. Jericho, there were four uh, highways, north, south, east, west, that converged right there. It became kind of like Columbus with Interstate 70 and 71. And it just made it easy. The caravan routes would pass through there. So there was a lot of wealth. There was a lot of trade, and, and, and along with the wealth and the trade would be the kind of what some people would call the underbelly of society and uh, the, 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 those kinds of things going on as well. And because it was that crossroads, it was also uh, uh, one of the main taxation centers in Israel. The, Rome, the Romans uh, had conquered Jerusalem, and they were in Jerusalem and, and uh, Israel were under their dominion. And there were three main taxation centers in Israel at that day. And Jericho was one of them. And we encounter uh, one of those tax collectors. And it was also home to uh, priests and Levites. Uh, in, in God's economy into the Old Testament, as the land of Israel was divided up, 
uh, parceling out the land, and each tribe got different. Por- the, the Levites didn't get land. They, they were dependent upon the generosity of God's people in the Old Testament, uh, but they did have cities that they lived in, and they would go to work. They didn't, it wasn't like a full-time job. You kind of served by lots. You, you would you, you didn't, it'd be kind of like having a different priest every month, a different Levites every month, kind of. So they, they would live in Jericho and other places, but then they would travel to Jerusalem. You might remember uh, another story of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. There, there was a guy that was on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, or maybe it was the other way around. And after he was accosted, there was a priest that went by and a Levite that went by on that road to Jericho or from Jericho. So uh, it was a very well-known, very um, populous city, very important city. It was considered a garden city. It was beautiful in that day. The walls of Jericho had been rebuilt and uh, it was really a beautiful town, uh, giving credit to the commerce and, and the wealth that was available there. So that's the city, the sinner, the sinner, the sinner. Wait a second. There we go. And there was a man. There was a man there. Uh, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, it's interesting. His name, Zacchaeus, means pure. And I think it probably signified the hopes and dreams that his parents had for him when they named him Zacchaeus. And like a lot of us, uh, he did not fulfill uh, for a major part of his life, perhaps. We don't know how old he was when we encounter him here in Luke 19. But he definitely wasn't fulfilling those dreams that his parents had for him when they named him Zacchaeus. We kind of pick names that we like, that sound good, that are modern or whatever. Uh, Especially in that day, they picked names that had meaning to them, that they wanted uh, to be kind of like shape the identity of their children. And and so Zacchaeus, and here he is, (laughs) a tax collector. We'll get to some more of that in a moment. Um, Just... Just to let you know, kind of like the, kind of more towards the end of the story of Zacchaeus' life. And this is probably why we, he's called by name. Uh, and there are other, five other tax collectors that are mentioned in the Gospels. And, and Matthew is one of them. Matthew, one of the 12 disciples. And, and Zacchaeus is the only other one that's named. And it's interesting because uh, he later, now the, the Bible doesn't tell us this in, in Scripture, but Clement of Rome, who was a church historian and a church father, tells us that Zacchaeus became pastor of a church in Caesarea. In fact, he was followed uh, when his pastorate was up, however that happened, by a guy by the name of Cornelius in Caesarea Philippi. Cornelius was the guy that Peter encountered uh, and went and shared the gospel after Peter had that experience of a sheep coming down from heaven. And God said, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, I'm never going to eat anything unclean. And God's really teaching him about people. And so Peter ends up going and shares the gospel at the home of Cornelius. And so that's probably why we have his name. Because people that were reading these documents in that day would say, oh, yeah, Zacchaeus. I, uh, this is how he got started. This is, where we, this, this is his testimony. And Cornelius, yeah, yeah. So it was probably because of those reasons that were given those names, because a lot of people that we encounter in Scripture are unnamed. And we just, there was a tax collector, there was a prostitute, there was a whatever, you know, so these people had prominent stories a little bit later on, uh, and that's probably why we have that name. So the story of Cornelius is in Acts chapter 10. Now he was, not only was he a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. He was a chief, that means... I keep, I, keep looking, I keep looking at that screen, and uh, it's not the same as this screen. They're not coordinated, and uh, so I get, I get a little bit, I get confused. <laughs> we're we're going to coordinate them here eventually, and uh, 
uh, for my sake uh, at least. So he was a chief tax collector. Um, this position had to be purchased from Rome. In fact, the way the tax collection worked, system worked in Rome of that day, they would conquer territories, and Israel was one of those conquered territories, and then Roman senators or other wealthy citizens would pay Rome for the right to collect taxes from that territory. And, and then so they would hire uh, people that would be over that territory, and then it would just kind of like subdivided amongst people. And if you wanted to be a chief tax collector, you probably started off as a tax collector. I don't know. And, and then you work your way up. But when you had enough money, you could purchase the position when it was available of being the chief tax collector. And so think of a pyramid screen scheme there. What you've got is they're benefiting in their personal pocketbook from the Taxes, not only what's collected from the citizens that has to go to Rome, but the other tax collectors that worked for the chief tax collectors had to tax collect more than what was due so that they could line their pockets. And then they had to collect even more to line the pockets of the chief tax collectors. And they had to collect even more to line the pockets of the Roman senators and wealthy people. And, so, and they had the full authority and power of the Roman army behind them. You dared not not pay your taxes. And not only, I mean, you think taxation is unfair in, in, in our country at times. You know, they, just, they had to, all they had to do is kind of like snap their fingers perhaps. And there'd be a Roman a legion there. Maybe not a whole legion, but there'd be some Roman soldiers there to enforce this. You, you did not dare question. And you could be taxed for anything. There were certain taxes that you had to pay. And that's why the taxation center was in Jericho because of the, the crossroads of the highways. Um, and so the, the, these men, the tax collectors and, and the chief tax collectors uh, would often use their power to increase their power and their wealth. And isn't that the way that it goes sometimes with powerful men and women? They don't use their power and leverage it for those who are less fortunate. They use their power to leverage their own power in their own positions, in their own profits. And they, the tax collectors had that full force of Rome. Tax collectors, if you're familiar with the New Testament, were often lumped in with other sinners. And they like, I mean, on one hand, everybody would say, yeah, nobody's perfect. We've all sinned, that kind of thing. But sinners, and you got to kind of do this, the quotation marks, and say it with some scorn. Sinners, you know, like meaning the worst of the worst. The worst of the, lo of the worst, often lumped together in scripture, tax collectors and harlots or prostitutes. In Jewish thought, uh, let me read something that was, uh, I, I found that kind of portrays the, the, the opinion of Judaism, the Jews of that day, towards tax collectors. The Jews detested the tax collectors, and only on account of their abusive and tyrannical attitude, but because of the very taxes that they were forced to collect by the Roman government, these were a badge of servitude and a constant reminder that God had forsaken his people. And these tax collectors were siding with the enemy, right? So the tax collectors were always classed by the people with the harlots, usurers, I mean money lenders, gamblers, thieves, and dishonest herdsmen who lived promiscuous, lawless lives. Some of the common terms for tax collectors were licensed robbers and beasts in human shape. According to rabbinism, there was no hope for a tax collector. They were unredeemable. Uh, they were excluded from all religious fellowship, including the temple and synagogue. Their money was considered tainted, and it defiled anyone who accepted it. They could not serve as a witness in any court of law. They were unredeemable. They were hated. They were outcasts, and they were traitors to their country, and an embarrassment to their family, who might have named one of them Zacchaeus. So he was wealthy. Uh, he was ext probably extremely wealthy. Now, it's not a sin to be wealthy. The Bible nowhere condemns wealth as a problem in and of itself. It does say that the, the, the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, but money itself is not. It's not 
uh, holy to be poor, and it's not sinful to be rich. It's our attitude towards money. Are we dependent upon it? Is it a badge of honor for us? Is it a way to boost our own self-esteem with the things that it can purchase? So there's, there's a lot of uh, things. Now, in Luke 18, just the chapter before this, Jesus uh, encountered another wealthy young man who in Scripture is known not by name, but by this phrase, the rich young ruler. So he comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? And you're familiar with that story, perhaps. You can go back and read it in Luke chapter 18. And Jesus, uh, as soon as Jesus, you know, pretty much honed in on the fact that this guy loved his money, he loved his wealth, and his wealth was more like an idol, more like a god to him. And there was no way he was going to be separated from any amount of his money And Jesus said to him, you know, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and then you'll come and have wealth. You'll have a position in the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is not saying that the kingdom of God can be purchased by any amount of money. But Jesus was saying that no man can serve God in money. No man can serve two masters. And that rich young man was not willing to give up the master that he was serving in his wealth, in his money. And so he went away sad. Let's think about Zacchaeus for a moment in terms of his standing before God. And there's some scriptures I want you to look at here. First one is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now, Paul is writing this later on. Paul didn't understand this before he became a Christian. But as Paul began to look back over his life and understand the real purposes of God, Paul was able to write this. And Paul's including himself in the word part of this. Were meaning used to be. Used to be past tense. Now this describes the the condition before God of anybody who has not yet received Jesus Christ. Anybody who has not yet received Jesus Christ. This describes their life. So as for you, look at what he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You know, physically alive, but spiritually separated from God. God all around you believe in the existence of God, but not God in you. Dead, dead to God, dead to the things of God. Separated from God. Death means a separation. So as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Now Paul is writing to Christians in the city of Ephesus. So he's talking about used to here. So he's reminding them of from, from whence they've come. So in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time. All of us. Every every person who is currently a believer and following Jesus Christ has experienced that salvation in Jesus. Uh, All of us at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, just giving in to the appetites of our body, of our flesh, and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Not, not, not a pretty picture. But Paul goes on in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and talks about how much God loves us. In spite of the fact that this is true, greatly, greatly loved by God. And, and really this describes the reason and the need for salvation. And Zacchaeus was a man in need of salvation. Paul also wrote about this in Romans chapter 3, in verses 9 through 12. What shall we conclude then? Do we, talking about his Jewish brethren, uh, do we have any advantage? (laughs) The Jews of that day would have said, sure, we're God's chosen people. Look, he's... We have the Ten Commandments. We have the nation of Israel. We have, you know, the Messiah and all of that. We're we're, we're God's chosen favorites. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? He says, not at all. For we've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles. Now, on that day, you were either a Jew or you were a Gentile. Gentile meaning non-Jewish. So, in a Jewish mind, Jews or Gentiles, uh, uh, are all alike, are all under the power of sin. All. Under the power of sin. As it is written, and he's quoting from the Old Testament here, uh, there are Hebrew scriptures, there is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. All have turned away. Everyone have together become worthless, and there is no one who does good, not even one. 
So that's, that's Paul, his description of, uh, of people that are apart from Christ. Now, what we know about Zacchaeus is because the summary statement, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save, what? The lost. We know that Zacchaeus was lost. Now, what does that mean, lost? Lost obviously means separated from. If a child is lost, they're separated from their parents. But the word lost in Scripture uh, is actually stronger than that. The word lost means destruction, destroyed. Jesus came to rescue and to restore those who've been destroyed. Now the sad part sometimes about being lost is your life can be destroyed and you not even know it. It was a blindness. It can be a denial uh, along with that. But that word lost. So Zacchaeus was lost. And as we look at him, his life was destroyed, not because he was a tax collector and not because he was wealthy, and not because he was collect. I mean, the tax a taxation system. Uh, is, the governments are set up by God, and Paul wrote that we should, you know, uh, obey the governments. And that um, render Jesus said, "Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's." You know, talking about the question of paying taxes. You know, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, but give to God the things that belong to God. And and, and so. Um, his life was destroyed, not by the things that he had done, the choices that he had made, but those things gave evidence of it. They were more like the fruit uh, from the root of that disconnectedness from his creator. Um, Zacchaeus, we could say, is unholy. Now, that you won't find that word in this passage of Scripture, but since we're talking about holiness and the true uh, beauty of holiness and the holiness of Jesus, we could say Zacchaeus was holy. The word holy uh, just simply means set apart, special, reserved by God, for God. And, and, you know, every follower of Christ is holy. Every, every, (laughs) if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are holy. Now, that, that, sometimes that's, that's kind of like a hard uh, descriptive title to wear because, because of why. We can all think of the last unholy thing we did or the multitude of them, right? We, 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 we keep that in our minds. But nevertheless, God has set us apart for himself. Zacchaeus was unholy and he met the Holy One and he wanted a closer look. Zacchaeus wanted a closer look. He was more than curious. I I believe perhaps we we could assume that maybe he heard about Matthew. Remember Matthew, Levi in scripture? Matthew was a tax collector. Now not, he's never described as a chief tax collector, but he was a tax collector who had started following Jesus. And this is, in this story in Matthew, in Luke chapter 19, is is Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. So it's towards the end of that three-year period of time where he's on his way to Jerusalem and ultimately the cross. And uh, uh, so it, it's so maybe Zacchaeus had heard about. Hey, I've heard there's a tax collector, former tax collector. What was his name? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, Matthew, maybe. I don't know. But he's actually a Jesus follower. And, and maybe, maybe Zacchaeus was thinking, maybe there's hope for me. Maybe, maybe I'm not unredeemable. Maybe, maybe there's a new life for me. Maybe the emptiness inside of him was crying out. And he finally started paying attention to it. Maybe. Maybe wealth was not fulfilling its promise of fulfillment. Maybe his success in the eyes of some parts of the world was not as everything that it was advertised to be. I believe perhaps he wanted the life Jesus wanted for him. And I think the end of the story reveals that. I think he wanted a new life. He wanted a different life. He wanted to be free, not just from tax, tax collecting, but freedom from sin that dominated his life and the separation that he knew he had from God. And he wanted something different. And he climbs up in that tree. So we think about, (laughs) 
his conversion. Jesus comes by uh, and says, uh, uh, Zacchaeus, come on down. You're the next contestant on the prices right now. Come on down from going to your house to stay. And that word stay means spend the night. So Jesus invited himself over. And of course, he's the Lord. He can do that. He told his disciples, you know, get, on the night of getting ready for the Passover, by the way, go into town and you'll see a donkey tied up to a post. Untie the donkey and bring it to me. And if anybody questions you, just say the Lord has need of it. Jesus assumes he has right over people's property. No, if he's wrong, or if he's right, you know, uh, does he have right over what we call our property? You know, Jesus. The scripture says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And I've never found anything in the entire Bible that says God has signed ownership over to anybody. Ever. So the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Everything in it, Jesus assumes he has the right over uh, such things. Um, so he says, come on down. Come on down. So, um, there's a dynamic interplay between repentance and salvation. You know, we, we could argue which comes first, the chicken or the egg. That's an unending, unsolvable dilemma. But when it comes to the, the role of repentance and salvation, repentance does not earn salvation. In fact, there's nothing, nothing that can earn salvation. Scripture is clear. It's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy that he saves us. It's for, for, for by grace are we saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It is so clear. But it's also so clear that repentance is a part of that. In fact, if you read through the Gospels, especially like in Mark's Gospel, the very first words out of Jesus' mouth as he's traveling around is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repent. Change the way you think. Change what you believe. There's something new on the horizon. There's something new breaking forth. And the very life of Jesus calls for repentance. And somehow Zacchaeus understood that. We know that because of the result in his life. He stood up and said to the Lord, this is verse 8, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, this is a very public statement. Very public statement. And people heard this. Half of his possessions to the poor? I'm sure they started thinking, how low does your income have to be to be classified as poor? What's the, what's the poverty level here in Israel? You know, well, maybe I'm, I'm just over it. I'm not going to get, I'm not, you know, you know, people are probably starting to think, how much money am I going to get out of this? And then he says, and if I have cheated anybody, and everybody's going, uh-huh, I'm one that you cheated. No, if, there's no if about it, Zacchaeus, we know your reputation. We've all suffered because of it. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. That's not what earned him salvation. That's the fruit. That's the result. And it's a reorientation of his entire being. It's summarized in that one statement. But let's think for a moment about the Savior who seeks. In Luke 19, 5. Do, 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 do. There we go. Luke 19, 5. When Jesus reached the spot, now we're kind of going back in the story a little bit. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house. He knows my name. How did he know my name? Maybe, maybe, maybe it was as simple as, uh, see that guy up there in the tree, Jesus? He's a notorious chief tax collector. So maybe, maybe the cr crowd was cluing him in. Or, or, or maybe Jesus just knew him. Like he would know us. He knows your name. He knows about you. He knows about each one of us. It's because he cares. I was in college. It was actually about my second or third year. 
And uh, I recalled an incident from my freshman year where a professor that I didn't yet never had until my third year of college, I remember this from my first year of college, walked past me one day and said, hello, Mr. Hewton. My, my, my last name has been mispronounced my whole life. That's okay. I don't care what you call me. And uh, so later on, when I had him as a professor, I asked him, I said, Dr. Broom, how did you know my name? As a freshman, you walked past me and said, hello, Mr. Houghton, Houghton. And, uh, uh, and I said, he said, well, I get, I get the pictures of every incoming freshman. And I memorize them with their names. That would have been about 400 to 450 people. I think he had a photographic memory that probably helped. But nevertheless, you know, he cared enough to know. That, that, that's impressive, isn't it? You know, uh, he, he knew Zacchaeus by name. Zacchaeus, come on down. And I, I don't think Jesus was forcing himself, because Jesus doesn't force himself on anybody. When he says, I'm going to stay at your house. He's, he's inviting himself over. But I think he could see in Zacchaeus' heart that Zacchaeus would welcome that. He'd welcome that. Really? You'd... That, that, that's, nobody comes and stays at my house unless they're my minions. <laughs> nobody wants to hang out with me. And the ones that do, it's probably because I'm their boss. You know how that goes. And, and just, could you just imagine? Can you put yourself? Here's this rabbi, teacher, uh, Messiah proclaimed, you know, and Savior and uh, this miracle worker and, you know, this holy man, this, uh, he wants to stay at my house? Wow. You know, Jesus would love to invite himself into your heart. <laughs> he would love to invite himself into your heart. He'd love for you to say, come on in, Jesus. Just like Zacchaeus said, come on home. Come on home. And obviously, there was more happening here than Jesus just coming and going to Zacchaeus' house. In words that are not expressed in Scripture, Zacchaeus placed his trust in Jesus. He embraced Jesus. More than just physically, with a hug, he embraced him for who he was. He saw in Jesus salvation. He saw in Jesus the rescue of his very soul. He saw in Jesus what his heart longed for, but that he had missed all of his life. So let's think about the Savior for a moment. Nope. I don't like this system. Nope. I will. My goal is to have my computer up here. I can see it and all of these be synced together. Um, so just be patient with me. So the Savior, the Savior who seeks. The Son of Man came. What? To seek. This is the summary. To seek and to save the lost. Jesus is always the seeker. People that start seeking him are because he started seeking them first. Jesus blew his disciples away one day when he said, you didn't choose me. <laughs> I chose you. Really? You, you wanted me? You, you like me enough to want me to hang out with you? And what, what we see in Jesus is, is beautiful holiness, right? And one of the things that we're wanting to do in this whole series of messages is just blow, blow our, all of our misconceptions out of the water about true holiness. Because we, we, we have misconceptions about holiness. And if you really think about it, you do. All of us do. You know, sometimes we think of a holy man as one of those guys with a white robe that lives in Tibet, right? Or, or you know, didn't 
Eddie Murphy do a movie a few years ago called Holy Man, you know, and, uh, and we have ideas, and I'm not, I'm not being knocking or being critical uh, of churches that have holiness in their name. Well, I'm not being, it's like, well, they're the only ones that are holy. If you don't have holiness in your name, then you're not and we associate it, we, the word holy with every expletive that there is, from cows to cow manure, right? It's like, th- this, just think of how we use the word holy. A- and we, we often associate it with clothing styles and makeup or not and hairstyles or not. Somehow the men get off the hook on all those things, um, but not the ladies. And... You know, I'm, I'm not, not being critical, but think about it. That, that's associated with holiness. And, and really, holiness is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. And Jesus is the holy one. And, and yet, look at this. Jesus, and we often think of holy ones as not wanting anything to do with unholy ones. Maybe, maybe you've heard this. Hopefully you've never said this. You know, at, at, at the break room at work, I'm not going to go hang out with them because all they do is cuss. Oh, so the holy ones don't want to hang out with the unholy ones. Hmm. Let me ask you, would Jesus have said that? Jesus invited himself home. Matthew had a banquet with other tax gatherers and other unholy people. Jesus, the holy one, felt perfectly at home in the midst of unholy ones. Isn't that amazing? Jesus loved people who were nothing like him. (laughs) Isn't that a good thing? (laughs) It is for me. And, 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 And not always, but people who were nothing like him liked him. Even in his holiness. Sometimes people will be around me as a pastor and they might, you know, curse and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, pastor. And I'll say, you know, I always think this and sometimes I say it. I'm, I'm not the, it doesn't bother me, first of all. That's what I think. It doesn't bother me that you've just cussed. And you're not accountable to me anyway. But I get it. I, I, you know, but it doesn't bother me. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the, 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 the beauty of Jesus' holiness and his, un, I was starting to say undying, but his dying love for every one of us. And we're all start off unholy, separated from God, dead in our trespasses and sins. And the Savior seeks. Now, now the truth is, the only people he has to seek are unholy people. <laughs> The only people he has to seek are people that are sinners in the first place. We're all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We just classify some people as worse sinners than others, right? We, do, we just put some people as worse sinners than others. And, and Zacchaeus was in that category in that day as the worst of the worst. Who would you put in that category? Not names, but what people would you put in that category? You know, somebody that runs a drug cartel. Somebody that runs a child prostitution ring or uses child prostitute. You know, we would, but this is what begins to blow us away. Jesus would seek them out. And he would probably say to them, go your way and sin no more as he did on more than one occasion with people. But his love compels him, draws him to people like you and me. The name Jesus means Jehovah saves. From Matthew one twenty one, the angel said, you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Salvation is the very meaning of his name and the very essence of what he's about. He is seeking after um, people that are lost, and that's all of us. And what does lost mean? Destroyed. 
He delivers us from an empty way of life. Peter wrote it like this, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Paul said it like this uh, in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. Paul said, Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul says about himself, Of whom I... Am the worst. Paul would have said in terms of sinner classification, I'm worse than a tax collector. Paul considered himself the worst of the worst. But for that reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Genuine holiness is attractive. It's repulsive to some. It's repulsive to the religious spirit. It's repulsive to the Pharisees of that day and the citizens of that day. And those citizens, you know, their responses in verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Which means I'm not really a sinner. At least not like he's a sinner. Maybe I'm a sinner, but I'm a better sinner than he is, or maybe he's a better sinner than I am, however that works in that sentence construction, right? You know, he's a worse sinner. Than I, yeah, I'm not perfect. You know, religion is a facade. It's a veneer. I've used this analogy before. I've got countertops at home that look like marble or granite. I forget which one it is, but it's a veneer. It's just covering up particle board. <laughs> it looks nice. I've seen that at some of your houses. The very same veneer that I have, you have it in your kitchens too. It's beautiful. And there's, religion can be very beautiful and rituals can be very beautiful and formal. And, but it's a facade. It's a cover up. Only Jesus can transform the heart. Rituals cannot do that. Religion cannot do that. Even Protestant rituals. <laughs> we won't go into that today. So the summary, getting back to that because time is up. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Salvation is the restoration of our lives to what God originally intended them to be. Salvation is God destroying the destruction that the evil one has inflicted that we have joined in because of our sin and our rebellion. John wrote it like this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So how does Jesus destroy destruction? With salvation. Restoration. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. It's the, sal it's the restoration of our true humanity. Zacchaeus went from using people to get things to using things to bless people. He saw people as a means to his end prior to his conversion. After that, by his own words, he saw things as a means to bless people. He saw people as more important. So in God restoring our humanity, he restores us to one another. In God restoring our true humanity, he restores us to one another. There's a whole series of sermons built in there, but he would restore nations and tribes and tongues, all peoples on the earth, all lives, all peoples from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every race. He would restore us to one another. In restoring our humanity, he restores us to the true glory that he created us with. And we're growing into that. We're growing into that. When you take a closer look at Jesus, and I hope you will, take a closer look at Jesus, 
I think you'll be drawn to him. I think when you see him and can get rid of any misconceptions that, that you've accumulated in your mind, and you may not even know that you have them yet. When you take a closer look at Jesus, I think you would be attracted to him, his life, his goodness, the way he related to people, the way that he did not use his position of power to increase his power, but he used his power only to bless other people and to lift people up. I think you would be attracted to him. And I think that would compel you, as it did Zacchaeus, to forsake all of your idols, everything that you've exalted above the knowledge of God, everything that's more important to you than Jesus, not by law, not by command, but by compulsion. Because there's something compellingly beautiful about the pure holiness and life of Jesus Christ. Who loves you, gave his life for us, rose from the dead, and waits to be invited. Let's pray. So Father, thank you for this beautiful story about Zacchaeus. It's really a story about Jesus and your great love for every one of us. And there may be some that, that hear this either this morning or by way of Facebook or YouTube. There may be some that feel like they're unredeemable, hopeless, helpless, that what they've done is too, they're too far gone. But God, nobody's too far gone for you. Lord, I, I pray, I pray for hope to be reborn in lives. I pray, God, for genuine transformation through conversion, salvation. I pray, God, that we would come to embrace you wholeheartedly, without reservation. And I pray for anyone hearing my voice, either live or video, that right where they are, right now, they could pray and simply invite Jesus and embrace him, receive him. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Pray this prayer. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Remake my humanity. Restore me to your original purposes. Forgive me of my sins. I receive you as Savior, Lord, and friend. We're going to stand. We're going to sing a closing song. And we're going to make this a